Welcome to a new episode of OM on the Move. Today, joining us, Carlos Olarte, partner at Olarte Mori. We will talk about PadHub again and how this new platform is helping filers worldwide. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. You're also my brother, right? That's true. <laughs> okay. Um, continuing on our previous um, episode regarding PadHub, uh, and now that PadHub is entering the U.S. market this month, please tell us, who, who's PadHub for? Um, originally, uh, it was designed for what we considered law firms and startups, universities uh, in countries outside of the LATAM region to uh, broaden their typical footprint in the region. In other words, these were users who may have contemplated Latin America as a possibility, but in light of costs of traditional filing and prosecution, excluded the region or perhaps just limited to Brazil and Mexico or simply excluded the entire region because of that cost-benefit analysis uh, they performed. So that's who I believe um, the original uh, target was. I think as AdHub has developed, there have been uh, new targets. Uh, a new audience has, has found interest, and uh, this new option of going into the U.S. with PadHub um, has uh, been very attractive for local and you know Latin American regional clients that um, facing the possibility uh, of a national phase entry, um, in particular for the U.S. Um, and PadHub's new option of just providing a, a relatively cost-friendly application to enter the national phase for the United States and buying some additional time for these clients has resulted uh, in a very attractive proposition um, because essentially what uh, PadHub is providing is additional time to determine if, in fact, that patent or eventually that, that family, um, which obviously the national phase entry, the U.S. national phase entry will be part of, uh, is still attractive for investors typically, uh, maybe 15 months down the line. So that additional time looks really good for that type of applicant. I think that's another another target. Um, and I think a, a, another additional target, which uh, wasn't originally contemplated, were some larger filers, again, external to LATAM, outside the Latin American region, um, that weren't necessarily small filers, uh, small upstarts, uh, smaller firms or universities, but rather already big filers. Uh, but they're known as big filers in the U.S. or big filers in Europe. But typically, the Latin, Latin American region was not a typical section, a typical um, option for these filers uh, because they consider, for different reasons, um, uh, that it wasn't worth it because I can litigate the patent here. The cost benefit analysis didn't swear away with you know current budget uh, requirements. But where, if they saw an option where they could file in the region and also buy some time, right? They could just file. I want to see what happens in 15 months, but I don't have to pay for the entire um, prosecution process. I just I want to just get my foot in the door um, and obtain that filing date. And many times in South America, for a lot of the jurisdictions, you're talking nothing happens for 18 months. That's useful. Um, there have been some filers where that has generated, uh, if you will, a sort of pilot program for L Latin America where, hey, we want to extend our footprint out. We can do it at a different cost. Um, and start developing a review process where if the asset is still of interest 18, 24 months later, um, then they'll convert it to a regular um, prosecution project. And, you know, hopefully that, that'll turn into a patent and have that asset alive. So that's, a, I guess, a third uh, target. 
new target uh, where Pad Hub has uh, resulted useful. We're mentioning this concept of time. Uh, so let me circle back again. And well, why is buying time or why is time so important? What's, 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 what's so important about just buying time and, and having an application float um, for a good amount of time? Why is this so important? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, if one, if one is looking at the patent system for the first time, typically a first user, a junior user of the patent system, what one sees and what one wants is I want my patent as quickly as possible, right? So I can have that right, ready to go. Uh, but once you're in the process, and you figure out that the patent system requires you to basically pay up front for everything and maybe you'll get a patent, right? Um, that starts to become an expensive proposition. So that line item in your budget typically starts to explode and it increases exponentially many times uh, once you hit the national phase applications, which is when you know, your attorney is telling you, you know, you only have protection for your original country. If you want protection in other countries, that's going to take, and to find a lawyer in that country, you have to pay that law firm to file and prosecute, right? And when you start seeing those numbers, and then your numerator is the number of countries, and then you start throwing in translations as well, those numbers start to get big quick. And what many times occurs is that timeline doesn't jive with your investment timeline for your project. Right, so you're looking for money to obtain some protection that might you might eventually obtain at a later date, two, three, four, five years down the road. Um, so it's sort of a bet you're making a, a big bet at the beginning, right? And what's going to limit that bet many times is you know one your cash flow, what's in your what's in the bank, and balancing that against what's the upside is the size of the country, the size of the market, the importance of the market for my you know, business conditions or my business model eventually. And you know, will a patent eventually be worth um, enforcing? Can I enforce it properly? Um, how strong is a patent? Um, so all of these items uh, you're looking at, and typically you know, the, the idea is, okay, this is going to work. This is going to help me out with my business model. This is going to introduce value uh, to my economic proposition to investors, right? Typically, you're, you're, you're pitching this uh, project to investors, and one of the items is, where do I have protection? But you got to pay for this up front. Um, if there is a way where you could extend these, uh, these uh, investments into the patent process, if you could extend, obtain more time before you actually have to make payment. So a great example was when the PCT rolled out in the 70s, right? Before the 70s, you basically had to come up with the money at month 12. PCT extended that time. It would give you an additional 18 months, essentially, right? Before you actually had to say, okay, now I really want to go into these countries. So you paid that international phase, about your 18 months. What Pad Hub offers here is at the national phase for Latin America, right? Now for the U.S. additionally, but for Latin America originally. Um, what Pad Hub gives you is not the uh, possibility of completely avoiding a, a filing cost, a filing uh, activity at month 30, month 31. Um, but what it is extending is you may not necessarily want or have the possibility of prosecuting. Right, so why do you have to pay for that prosecution part up front? Um, isn't there a way I could just ask someone to file the application in a notice? I have, you know, evidence that it was filed, and buy enough time, and they'll let me know when your time is up. A time can be eighteen months, twenty-four months, thirty-six months, five years, right, depending on the country, and nothing happens. So. That additional amount of time, what it is, is offering this opportunity to obtain the option of protection so that during that time, um, if you are in an investment round and people are asking questions, where do you have protection? And if you only say, and this is valid, obviously, only the U.S., U.S. and uh, the EPO, um, if you can throw in an additional region, 
that's a useful um, uh, some useful leverage. It's not maybe it's not a two x or three x leverage, but it's useful. Some additional money will get paid for it, and typically more than what you may have invested, especially if you're going to be using cat help, right? So you have these additional countries. Um, so sometimes folks ask me, but is, is that real? I mean, is I mean, it's Latin America. How much, you know, the percentage of the global uh, market, uh, how much does uh, Latin America actually offer? Um, I don't see it so much as a percentage of you know, the, the world market. Obviously, that's an important number. But I see it when many of our clients uh, come, you know, are big pharma, right? And what happens nowadays is big pharma, you know, they get together in January in San Francisco for the J.P. Morgan event and announce these beautiful uh, new deals, right, from their biz dev people. Uh, and they announced they're buying out a certain company, um, a biotech company typically, which has been, you know, pedaling really hard, protecting at very early stages their developments. But typically cash flow is a, a huge problem. And so they're protecting in, in relatively few countries unless they've managed to get a nice war chest also for the patent part. And when they got they get bought out. Typically, there's at least one meeting with the internal patent people from on the buyer side, and they ask for the list of countries, and it's three, four, right? Um, and there'll be a scramble to see through life cycle management, you know, quite other patents could be filed on, you know, future improvements, which, you know, it's obviously a, a, a valid uh, scheme. But you're going to many times lose out on protection of the compound patent, which is you know, the nice part in pharma and biotech. Um, and what where I eventually see the impact of that situation is uh, some poor local manager for the pharma company getting all excited, looking at some internal database that there's you know exclusivity until such and such date. And she asked the question to her headquarters, so we're good, right? And the answer is no, we never filed in your country, right? So we never have the patent, but we have these, you know, secondary patents, eh, which might work in this particular situation, which might not. But you, that opportunity, it's a lost opportunity. And when you look at the cost, at the impact, um, many times, all of the cases I've seen on the, on the, on the very small side, on the low side, you're, you're talking $5 million or lost opportunity for each of these particular cases. And taking into account that this traditional model of buying other company when they've hit some really nice research milestone um, is the way many of the deals are done nowadays. Internal R&D has dropped a lot. Um, it makes sense to consider for these smaller companies to start considering, hey, where else can we broaden our filing? Right, so in the particular case of Latam, in great part because you know eighteen countries speak the same language, Spanish, right, and makes it a lot easier to consider this area of the world. It's an interesting market for that particular sector. Uh, the markets are pretty decent, and I think work out well when you do that um, cost benefit analysis for purposes of including it at that very early stage. So, okay. So, if we also go back to who, who Pat Hub really works for, it would not be only focused to small entities, startups, individuals, universities. We could also be looking at mid-sized companies that are in the same boat that would have, would have patented it in, 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 in a broader sense from the beginning. Would that be... Would that be true as well? I mean, it's, it's not only for the small actors, but for the mid-size or even larger actors within the patent system? Yeah. Um, I mean, these mid-size large actors are annually, maybe once every three years, every five years, taking a look at their global filing strategies, right? Um, also, I think the pressures to reduce costs are permanent. Right to see what we can do to, you know, uh, get a bigger bang for the same buck every year, um, and so looking at larger companies, I think, is part of that evaluation. 
Um, especially if you are in a sector, again, maybe farm is a, a good example again, where you're not sure of a particular asset will necessarily be that useful, but where you want to at least have that optionality in place, uh, that filing in place, and you're contemplating a new region, a new country, taking again, LATAM, Latin America b- being this option for, for Pad Hub is, um, it may be something worth exploring in the sense that what happens as, as a pilot program, what happens if we extend our, not just our compound patents, but some of our improvement patents uh, in this area of the world? Because there has been some decent patent enforcement taking place because, you know, patents work, um, but we're not sure uh, for this other area, this other tier of uh, patent applications, if it's worth filing, what if we could just get the filing in place, get that you know foot in the door, um, and make that decision? And these are sophisticated users of the patent system that also have annual, not semester, evaluations of their portfolio. And for those particular patents, you know they've spent a relatively low amount just getting the foot in the door. Um, and if the asset is indeed something useful, which they find out three years later, but that's well within the um, uh, timelines and the, the, those windows that Pad Hub offers, right? Um, that optionality, they can keep it in place, pay to start prosecuting the application, and eventually have an asset in place, or otherwise, before they wouldn't have had it. And if you look at the numbers, uh, they'll probably shape up. You, you preserve that optionality. Previously, you you had not. Um, and you have something nice to show to that local manager eventually um, as far as exclusivity in the market. So I think that's so. Okay. There's definitely, I, I think, um, a potential use for some of the larger players as well with more sophisticated portfolios. Talking, talking about larger pl- players going into the U.S. market, we're, we're seeing a surge not only Latin America, in the U.S., from India, and from China. PadHub is entering the, 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 the U.S. market this month. How can PadHub serve Indian and Chinese players uh, wanting to file in the U.S.? Well, I think um, when you're going to have a, an amazing amount of competition, um, but I think uh, you know, depending on who the folks that are actually on the ground um, assisting PadHub in, in, in the U.S. and primarily the, the costs, right? This is a, this is a numbers game. Um, I think um, PadHub will be another option. PadHub partners in the United States that are helping with filing. I think our you know, folks that are top of the line, um, I think the experience that PadHub also offers on the digital pat- platform is going to be, you know, the um, something that hopefully moves the needle and that users will enjoy. Um, I think it's a very user-friendly platform. Um, and I think, you know, very clear on, on what's being offered. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to be another attractive player in the market uh, for Indian and Chinese players as well. It's just not going to be, you know, our you know, Lat- LATAM applicants, which are, or near the numbers that you see from China and and, uh, and India, so I think those are going to be the uh, the, the benefits from uh, that Pad Hub's going to be offering. Good luck with that. Okay. Well, great insight, and thank you very much uh, for all this. I think this further explains what Pad Hub does, uh, what is the, what it is expecting from the Latin American market, other markets. Now that we're going into the U.S. this month. And uh, again, thank you for your time and see you next time. Thank you very much, Roberto. Good luck with that out.